Good morning. Happy Thursday, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar this morning, um, State and Federal Policy Update, What's Next for School Health and School-Based Health Centers. I appreciate you all being here and welcome. So before we get started, just a quick, a couple quick, um, a quick, a couple quick housekeeping um, items. Um, if you are having any problems with audio, this is a Zoom platform. Hopefully we're all super familiar with how to use it, um, but you can also try calling in using the phone number on your webinar invitation. Um, and you can also adjust your audio settings using the audio settings link in the Zoom platform. We are recording today's webinar and a recording of the webinar and all the supporting materials such as PowerPoint slides will be sent out to everyone that registers um, at the um, later today. And then if you have any questions or you wanna make comments, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, I will be trying to monitor it, monitor it throughout the webinar and I will try to take pauses throughout um, to answer any questions that come in. So please feel free to be active on chat. We love to hear what you're thinking and any questions you have. If you don't know who I am, that's a nice picture of me. Um, my name is Lisa Eisenberg. I am the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance. I've been with CSHA for um, eight years and I help manage and run our state policy agenda, as well as work with our national organization to support our federal policies. That's me. Um, Sorry. Also, I'm going to be joined today with, by my colleague, Jessica, who will um, help monitor the chat and answer any questions that she can throughout the webinar. Okay, so before we get started in all the details on the webinar, I want to just pause and thank you all for being here. Um, I really appreciate your attendance. We have 50 attendees. That's incredible. I really appreciate you all being here. I don't know about you all, but I feel like this week has been a lot on top of a year and a half that has felt like a lot. Um, and maybe even, maybe it has felt like a lot even before then if you are working with students every day. So I just, I wanna appreciate you all for being here. Hope you can take a breather. There's gonna be a lot of information that I'm sharing in this webinar. Take what you are able to digest today um, review the slides later on, reach out to me if you have any particular questions and just, you know, acknowledge that there's lots that is in our brains and our hearts right now. And um, I appreciate you all for showing up. So thank you. Okay, with that said, um, if you're not familiar with us at the, the California, hopefully you are, hopefully you are familiar with CSHA and the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, if you're not, CSHA is the statewide organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. So we are dedicated to improving the health and well-being of young people, and we feel like one of the best ways to do that is by delivering health services in school settings, particularly through the school-based health center model, which is which are clinics on K through 12 school campuses. Um, so we are excited that you're here and you're excited to learn about our policy agenda and our priorities. We think this has been a pretty incredible year so far. Now that you know a little bit about me and a little bit about CSHA, um, we are gonna open a poll. I'd love to get a, a better sense of who is here today, who's in this virtual room with me. Um, so we are gonna open a poll shortly. Um, and I know we all wear different hats in different days, but if you could pick one that best defines your role today, are you a school-based health center practitioner or manager, other school health provider, school administrator or school board member, local or state advocate, community-based health provider, local or state policymaker and staffer or other? And if I haven't, you know, adequately given you an option on the poll, please feel free to type in your role and identity today would be lovely. While that's 
poll, well, we're giving folks a chance to answer that question. Just really quickly, I wanted to give a quick plug for our upcoming virtual conference. We host a conference every year um, that's dedicated to school-based health. Um, and this year is our second virtual conference. We will be hosting it in November. Um, so please take a moment to visit our website um, and uh, my lovely colleague, Jessica, will add a link in the chat as soon as she can. Um, but take a moment to visit our website. Registration, I believe is open or if it's not, it's opening very soon. Um, so please, I hope you will join us in November. And so with that, we'll close the poll and share the results. Um, we have lots of vari uh, variations, so welcome to all the people with different perspectives. Happy to have you. Lots of folks that are in the field, on, um, on the ground, delivering health services to our young people in our community, so I appreciate you all being here. So before I dive into the updates um, of the, the policy updates this year, I wanted to take a moment to share with you CSHA's 2021 policy priorities. So these are the goals that we set for us at CSHA and our work at state and federal policy and advocacy and, and sort of set our guideposts for the year. And so this is what we have all been working towards um, in our state and federal advocacy. So I'm gonna walk through them. There's information on our website, um, but uh, one and two are really about centering school-based health centers, both around advocating for federal and state funding for school-based health centers, as well as centering the school-based health center model in the post-COVID or as the case may be continuing COVID school reopening guidelines and efforts. Um, so that, those first two are really about the school-based school-based health center model and, and centering those in resource allocation and um, opportunities for advocating for more and better school-based health centers. The third one is um, advocating for improved substance use prevention and early intervention in schools through investment in Prop 64 and decreased punitive discipline policies. So a lot of our programmatic work with school-based health centers has been centered around supporting the integration of substance use prevention in behavioral health delivery and in healthcare delivery in our school-based health centers. And so we wanna make sure our policy and advocacy reflects what we're learning in best practices from our field, as well as acknowledging the need for um, particular substance use focus um, for young people, especially right now, especially this year. Um, the fourth one is to support increased coordination between state departments. And for us, this is specifically the Department of Public Health, the Department of Education, and the Department of Healthcare Services to support school-based health services. So I, I would say one of the primary ways we've worked towards this is by co-sponsoring legislation with some partners that would create the Office of School-Based Health at the Department of Education to sort of bridge some partnerships between, between the departments. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about exciting developments on that front a little bit later when we get into the updates. And then last, but certainly not least, I think we are in the midst of a lot of big conversations around healthcare financing and healthcare reforms um, that are bigger than specifically school-based health that are about how do we create a healthcare system that better meets the needs of communities and young people. And so we, we think school health services and we advocate for school-based school health services and school-based health centers to be a part of those conversations or at least um, ensuring that these reforms we are making as a state um, make sure that these health services and schools are more accessible and, and more sustainable. So those are our policy priorities. I hope as I go through the updates, you'll, you'll see the themes percolating throughout. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've been working for, for the field um, since this year. Okay, before we jump into specifics, um, I want to take a moment to just 
set the stage, paint a big picture about what I'll be covering this morning. So there are kind of three big chunks of information that I'll be sharing with you. The first one um, that I'm going to talk a lot about is our recently passed state budget. It passed in June and a bunch of trailer bills passed, um, passed later in the end of June and July. So we'll talk a lot. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the state budget. Um, and then, then I will cover some legislation that is still in play or isn't in play. And I'll talk about why. Um, right now, where we are in the calendar, we are toward the end of the state's legislative session. So legislators return from their summer recess this week, and they have until September 10th to pass any bills on to the governor for his signature. So we're right in the middle of kind of a legislative crunch time and with, with significant, significant deadlines looming. And um, so it's busy. And then the last part I will talk about is um, I will go over some really exciting developments for specifically for school-based health centers on the federal level and, and work that we have been doing with other state alliances and our uh, national organizations. And I want to offer the caveat that there's lots happening in education, in healthcare, in children's healthcare, in school health, I'm going to cover lots of things and there's by no mean am I going to cover everything. So you might be an advocate or you might be like, but I heard about this and Lisa didn't talk about it. So um, maybe it's not true, but I assure you there's, there's lots happening in California right now. And um, I will do my best to cover lots of things today. And by no means am I going to hit every important thing <laughs> in the state. So I appreciate your patience. All right, starting with the California state budget. Um, I wanna start with some high level takeaways before zeroing in into a lot of details. First, unfortunately, there's no specific funding for school-based health centers in this year's budget. That's a little bit, not to start out with a bummer, but that's the truth is um, we continue to advocate for dedicated state funding to the school-based health center model and it wasn't our year this year, but I do wanna acknowledge that there's really unprecedented funding this year in school-based health and student support services. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities in those investments for school-based health centers. And I will talk a little bit about how we see school-based health centers aligned with some of these investments. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that I think the recognition of school health, I know it's been a hard year, um, a hard year and a half, but I do think this recognition of school-based health um, is really a recognition of all the important work that you all are doing in schools and with students. And um, I think we're seeing some fruition come to be, which is some, some, some exciting developments um, come to fruition. So I, I do want to acknowledge that. I, it's in large part a lot of the effort that you have been giving to schools and communities. And then the third part, which is probably a little wonky, but I think is pretty interesting. Um, so the main budget passed in June, passed and signed in June. And um, I don't often pay attention to a lot of the trailer bills that pass after the budget. But this year, I think we saw a lot of trailer bills pass that included language pulled from legislation, from bills that other organizations were sponsoring, that we were sponsoring, that were kind of included in a trailer bill after the budget passed. And the role of a trailer bill um, not is, is really to sort of add language to state law regarding the implementation or the rollout or the expectations around big, big budget line items. So the main budget bill passes like a big overview of the budget and the trailer bill sort of follow trail um, with some specificity, some specificity, not all the specificity that we would always like, but at least some. Okay, I'm sure if you've been watching the news or reading articles um, in June, you probably saw at least little mentions of um, what is being called the Child and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. 
Um, this is one of the major investments in the state budget. Um, it sets an audacious vision, and I'm going to read this from the billing. Um, the I'm going to read this from the um, budget documents. It sets an audacious, audacious vision to transform California's behavioral health system into an innovative ecosystem in which all children and youth, 25 years of age and younger, regardless of payer, are screened, supported, and serve for emerging and existing behavioral health needs. So if you've worked in school-based health center, if you've worked in school-based behavioral health, you're like, yeah, this is what we've been doing. <laughs> it's been hard, but um, this, is, this is sort of what we've been trying um, to create, build a vision for. Um, so there are lots of different initiatives and projects within this $4 billion invest investment. I'm going to talk about only three of them in real detail because I, because I, I think they are the most immediately salient, salient to school-based health. So the first one is the Medi-Cal Managed Care Incentive Program. So what this will do is it will basically create a program starting um, next January, fast timeline, starting next January, where Medi-Cal managed care pl plans receive enhanced payments for the child and adolescent, the child and adolescent in their, that they cover um, for meeting certain, certain to be determined goals, um, all under this overarching goal of increasing access to preventative, preventive early intervention and behavioral health services for K through 12 children in schools. It's particularly focused on Medi-Cal managed, incentivizing Medi-Cal managed care plans to work and help deliver or help incentivize school-based mental health, behavioral health services. Um, it's $400 million is going into this program. Examples of possible interventions that are included in the trailer bill language are still fairly vague, like local, local planning effort, increasing telehealth, infrastructure, expanding work workforce. So these are sort of implementing social emotional learning. These are sort of big bucket examples of what this incentive program could go towards. We have been invited and are participating as a stakeholder in the group convened by the Department of Healthcare Services to provide input on this program. And for what it's worth, school-based health centers are named as an school-affiliated behavioral health provider in the department's fact sheet around this program. So we're there, I'll take it as a win. <laughs> Um, I do think that this, this is a good opportunity for school-based health centers, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the next slide. So the second investment is uh, the School-Linked Behavioral Health Partnerships and Capacity Competitive Grants. This is a competitive grant program that the Department of Healthcare Services is going to also oversee. Um, it is a $550 million total, um, 400 million of which is specific for preschool to grade 12 interventions. Um, I think of this as very similar to the Medi-Cal Managed Care Incentive Program, except in terms of typical projects and outcomes and goals, it's to increase infrastructure and increase accessibility and increase access to behavioral health services in school settings. The, the eligible entity is different. So where the first one, the money is going first to, at least first to Medi-Cal managed care plans, these competitive grants are um, eligible for a, a much wider um, slew of organizations. And that includes counties, city mental health authorities, tribal entities, local education agencies, institutions of higher education, publicly funded childcare and preschools, healthcare service plans, community-based organizations, and behavioral health providers. So this is still very much in the early stages, but we see a much wider uh, number of eligible entities that can compete can apply for these competitive grants. And we, are, um, we have yet to seen really, you know, we haven't seen an RFP for this. Um, so 
So this will be something that will probably roll out in um, the next calendar year, I would say. And then the third one is the Mental Health Student Services Act grant program. Um, this is $205 million. Um, and this is additional funding for subsequent rounds of an existing grant program um, that is run by the Mental Health Oversight and Accountability, Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Say, say that three times fast. Um, so they currently oversee this grant program. It's an additional investment um, for, for additional grants. And these, is, these grants provide funding to county behavioral health departments to partner with county offices of education or schools in the county to expand school mental health services. Phew, that's a lot. There's a lot of school mental health services, a lot of investments. Those are three big buckets in this pretty substantial initiative that are focused on school-based interventions for behavioral health. Um, so those are the three ones I'm gonna talk about. I'm also going to acknowledge that also in this initiative, there are lots of investments that I think are good for children and youth overall. And that includes that there's a um, creation of a virtual platform, like, an, like a virtual app platform that anybody can access and get referrals and do screenings and mindfulness activities. Um, and there's um, some workforce initiatives, including the creation of an, un, um, I think an unlicensed behavioral health counselor or coach position, I think particularly for working in schools. And then there's an investment in behavioral health infrastructure, which is also feels big and vague and we will see how that rolls out. So I'm gonna pause for a second and acknowledge that while these are a lot, this is lots of money, this is very exciting. It's great to see schools listed up um, at, the, at the top of this list and as a core strategy. I also wanna acknowledge that this information is probably pretty unsatisfying. I'm sure there's many of you thinking, what about, what do I do right now? like I'm in the midst of school reopening, I'm in the midst of serving students, like what am I gonna see right now? And what are these investments actually gonna look like? Like, yes, you're telling me trailer bill language, but like, what is this actually gonna look at like and mean for my work and our young people? And I understand and I empathize with those thoughts and I don't have answers to them and I want to acknowledge some hopefulness that I think we were going to see specifics roll out um, over the fall and early next year. We will be tracking them closely at CSHA. Um, we will share with you when we hear more specifics. We will probably do subsequent webinars about particular investments if it makes sense. Um, but just I know it's hard to be patient. I understand that. And um, the, the bill, the budget did just pass like a couple months ago. So there's a lot to expect to change and more specifics we will get in the coming, in the coming months to a year. I will, that reminds me to just make a comment. So while many of these investments are one are one time investments, meaning the budget says sort of, we are gonna invest in it this, this one time, um, lots of this funding is available over multiple years. So while the, it's included in this year's budget, it doesn't have to be spent in one year. There's many years that this money will roll out um, into these initiatives and projects. So I do think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so um, I covered all the specifics and I wanna talk a little bit about how I think this is an opportunity for school-based health center within the child and youth behavioral health initiative. So we were constantly talking, CSHA was constantly talking about school-based health centers in the budget negotiations as they were being decided. And we are continuing to talk about them as they are now being implemented. Um, I think, not I think, we at CSHA are adamant and committed to centering the role of school-based of of school health centers in delivering behavioral health. We believe they're an ideal model 
um, because of a couple of reasons, which I will go over. Um, so there's lots of research that shows that students effectively use or um, six, or students use school-based health centers for behavioral health services. I think there was one study we saw recently that found that students with access to school-based health centers we're 21 times more likely to visit school-based health centers for mental health treatment than anywhere else, um, than like a community clinic um, site. So I think that that is a testament to the availability of behavioral health services through school-based health centers. Um, I think the second benefit of school-based health centers in this model is that they provide integrated physical and behavioral health. So they co-locate primary care providers, nurse practitioners with behavioral health clinicians. Um, we know that young people don't often present to healthcare providers as needing behavioral health support. So often coming in for a sports physical can be an entryway to identifying behavioral health needs early and referring a young person to a behavioral health clinician for further follow-up. Um, and the flip side of that is we also know that young people with behavioral health needs also have co-occurring other, other co-occurring healthcare needs. So they might um, need help with weight management and healthy activity and healthy living as a you know co-occurring with their behavioral health needs. Um, so we think that this is the second really great reason that school-based health centers are well positioned for a lot of these state opportunities. The third one is school-based health centers leverage Medi-Cal providers. They met, um, about 70% of school-based health centers are run by community-based providers, such as federally qualified health centers, hospitals, mental health agencies, county health departments that are already Medi-Cal contracted providers. Um, so we think, you know, this emphasis on Medi-Cal, this emphasis on leveraging Medi-Cal, we think school-based health centers are well positioned to further and um, meet that hope, that desire um, to leverage Medi-Cal. Um, School-based health centers are effective at providing prevention and early intervention services. By design, school-based school health centers are public health prevention focused approach to youth healthcare. They're there to do screening for health needs early. Um, they also reach beyond clinic walls to do health education classes, to um, help support healthy, a healthy school environment, school garden. So I do think that there are a lot of ways that school-based health centers address public health needs beyond just the clinical needs they see in, in among their patients. Um, and then the last but not least is that school-based health centers increase equitable access to care. So um, school-based health centers are the current school-based health centers in California are predominantly located in schools where a majority of students are low income and students of color. So it is about centering resources in communities that have inequitable access and um, have existing barriers to accessing healthcare. So for those of you working in school-based health centers, I don't think any of this should be news to, news to you. Um, for those of you that aren't sold on school-based health centers, maybe I've sold you a little bit. Um, and this is, there is a link um, in the, on the slide and we will put it in the chat um, to a document that we worked on um, earlier this year that framed these benefits of school-based health centers to um, delivering child, uh, child and youth behavioral health services. Um, so we shared this with the Department of Healthcare Services, we shared this with advocates, um, and we will be continuing to sort of center school-based health centers in these ways, um, in these conversations. I'm gonna pause and see, I'm gonna open the chat just see if there's any initial questions that have come in. Um, I see a question about, can we get information on how school-based health centers play a role in back to school and COVID vaccinations? That's um, a great question. We have some initial resources that were in our most recent newsletter. And so if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please do so. Um, and you can reach out to me and I can forward it to you as well. That was focused on 
COVID um, vaccinations and back to school screenings and resources for school-based health centers. I would say that there, um, there's a lot of variation in how school-based health centers are doing this, but I would say many are preparing to, um, uh, are preparing to sort of support schools as schools are reopening. just scanning the chat really quickly to see if there's any questions. I just saw a question come in. Um, is there any way for us to access the data you just quoted? It is all on the, um, the uh, summary of the data and I hope citations, although now I have to double check, um, is on the memo. Um, so the, the data is sort of included that I just men mentioned. Jessica, did I miss any other questions that came, on, came in? No, those are, you've answered them all. Okay, great. Well, please continue to put in chat, uh, questions and I, I will continue to pause and see if, if more come up. Okay, so I know that that was a lot and we're still gonna be talking about state budget. <laughs> so the next investments that I'm gonna cover are on the California Department of Education, the education side of the budget. And these, these are some funding opportunities um, for specifically for students student health and student support. So the first one is um, an investment, a $2.8 billion investment in community schools. Um, community schools are general, are most generally, if you're not familiar with it, are sort of a, are a whole child approach to school leadership, school structures um, and education. So the, tra the budget trailer bill language lays out four general components of community schools. Um, one, they provide integrated support services in school campuses. So they leverage community-based supports and put them in school campuses. And this includes specifically the coordination of trauma-informed health, mental health, and social services. So if you're paying attention, you should be thinking, oh, that sounds like school-based health centers. <laughs> Um, the second component is family and community engagement, which may include home visits, home school collaboration, culturally responsive community partnerships to strengthen family well-being and st stability. The third component is collaborative leadership and practices for educators and administrators, including professional development to transform school culture and climate. And then the fourth component is extended learning time and opportunities, including before and after school care and summer programs. Um, so grants will become available. Um, I don't have a specific timeline for that, but grants will be available to local education agencies. Um, I, th I think I heard some, I saw some article that said 60% of this, this amount of funding would would cover 60% of all LEAs in the state. So it's a, it's a pretty transform transformational investment into community schools. Um, so grants are available, will be available to LEAs, local education agencies to establish new and expand existing community schools. And there are different grant amounts for planning or, or coordination for existing community schools and some ex maybe some ex an expansion grant, I believe. So there are different grant categories um, laid out as part of this investment. Um, the second one I'm gonna talk about is the School Health Demonstration Project. Um, talking about hundreds of millions and billions. So five, this is for $5 million, but it's not anything to sneeze at. Um, so this, this is a, a project that will be run um, in the Department of Education, and it will identify three technical assistance teams to provide two years of intensive support to 25 local education agencies in how to leverage Medi-Cal funding to support school health services. So some of the things, some of the opportunities some of the Medi-Cal funding streams identified in the trailer bill language to better leverage are the following. 
um, increasing participation in the two school Medi-Cal programs, the L LEA billing option program and the SMA school Medicaid administrative activities program. So these are two billing programs that LEAs can participate in directly to draw down Medi-Cal reimbursement. Um, also partnering with Medi-Cal managed care plans and or county mental health plans and the, the third um, strategy is contracting with community-based providers. So that's the second one. And then the third one um, is very exciting for me, very exciting for many of our partners because it is a culmination of, of advocacy work that CSHA done, has done for five years with some partners. So I'm very excited to announce that. Um, also included in the budget was funding for the Office of School-Based Health in the Department of Education. It is actually this office that is being tasked with overseeing the school health demonstration project. So um, included in the budget is $700,000 a year in ongoing funding. So this is not one-time funding, this is ongoing funding um, that would establish this office by January, 2022. Um, and you know, the office is established for the purpose of assisting local education agencies regarding current health related projects in the Department of Education. And the office will be tasked with collaborating with the Department of Healthcare Services and other departments involved in the provision of school based health services. So, um, one, if you, one of our policy priorities for a long time has been in to increase collaboration across state departments. Um, and so I think this, we believe that this office is gonna really help provide some continuity between departments, um, it, specifically around school-based health services. So we're very excited about this. I'm, I'm very excited about this. And the language that is in the budget trailer bill has been drawn a lot from one of the bills that we were co-sponsoring with a bunch of partners, um, which I will, talk about in a little bit in more detail. Um, so the CDE funding and what are the opportunities for school-based health centers? Um, so I hope as I was describing these, it's, it's, it's obvious where school-based health centers sort of fit into these opportunities for delivering school-based health services. Um, the first one is school-based health centers can be part of a community schools model by helping with that first big component of integrating health and support services into the school campus. Um, and I would also say that our school-based health centers thrive in school communities that are based on a community schools ethos where there is coordination and collaboration and there's an infrastructure with school part on the school partner side to to work well with community-based providers, healthcare providers, and sort of connecting students to care on campus. So we're really excited to see school-based health centers sort of thrive in a community schools model. There's also a really great blog post that um, will be posted in your chat with a little quote from our colleagues at Oakland Unified School District. And um, they've acknowledged that school-based health center are are a foundational component of their full service community schools model. So it's a great article that sort of outlines the role of school-based health centers. Um, and also in particular to answer a previous question, the role of school-based health centers in responding to the COVID pandemic specifically. So definitely please check that out when you have a second. Um, and then regarding the school health demonstration project, um, most school-based health centers leverage per um, utilize providers that bill Medi-Cal already. Um, so again, we think, well, school-based health centers aren't the only way for a school to leverage Medi-Cal to deliver health services. We think they are at least one of the ways um, and, and we would like to see um, that tested and emphasized in the demonstration project. Um, so we are working to lift up school-based health centers as, as one of those strategies. So that is a summary of the state budget. That took us, <laughs> that's taking us a lot. There's a lot of information there. So I'm gonna pause and see if any questions have come in. 
Yeah, there's and there's a question um, that says in com some recent conversations, there have been questions if the Office of School Based Health will focus only on behavioral health. And are you aware of their scope as it relates to health? It is not, it's not written to be specific on behavioral health. It is supposed to, um, it, is, it, is, it is supposed to encompass all health care services delivered in school settings. So it's not particular to behavioral health. I um, want to dispel that myth. Um, I will get to Healthy Start. That's uh, on our next slide. So I will get to that in a little bit. Um, so bear with me. I do want to hear from you all in the community. Um, I've talked a lot about funding and I realize we are um, closing in, like we only have 15 minutes. Um, but take a minute in the chat. Um, I want to hear from you. Make sure that your chat is set to everyone can see. What funding, funding needs do you have in your community? And what should these state funding opportunities prior, prioritize? So take a second. I'm gonna keep going, but please, I'd love to hear from you if you have thoughts on, well, we really need this specific thing or we really need this. Um, this is what we'd like to see prioritized. Um, and I will go back and make sure to capture some of those thoughts from you all. I. Do you feel good? Because I feel like the remaining sections are, are not quite as dense. So hopefully we can catch up on some time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the second piece, legislation that was moving this year and where we stand with some particular pieces of legislation. So as I mentioned, CSHA, um, we co-sponsored two bills this session. The first one was AB 563, which created the Office of School-Based Health that has been adopted into the state budget. So while the bill hasn't officially passed, the content and the policies have been sort of, um, have been adopted into the, the budget. So we are excited with that investment. Um, the second bill is SB 316, by Senator Eggman, it would allow same day billing for federally qualified health centers. And same day billing means an ability to bill, get reimbursed for two visits to the same patient on one day. So for instance, if a patient came in for primary care and behavioral health needs were identified and a warm handoff was given to a behavioral health clinician, the entity could bill for both of those visits, both of that, those staff times, those clinicians time during the day. Why we are co-sponsoring about half of our school-based health centers are run by federally qualified health centers. And um, this warm handoff same day billing is probably a, is a practice that we see as fairly common among our school-based health centers and the um, disincentive to provide this care through the billing practices is something we would like to see um, ended. So that's why we're working with partners um, to address that same day billing issue. Um, it will actually be heard in the assembly appropriations today, which is the last committee it will be heard in and before going to the assembly floor for a vote. Um, so we, to be determined how that goes today, I think we see a lot of support in the legislature um, and unfortunately have received opposition from the Department of Healthcare Services regarding that bill. So we are working with our co-sponsors and our author's office to address um, those the department's concerns and hopefully see that bill continue on its path. So other legislation to note, there are thousands of bills that have been introdu introduced this year. So this is uh, hundreds, hundreds, thousands. Um, this is a, is a tiny snapshot of some bills that we have been tracking this year. Um, AB 32 will extend current tele, so the current telehealth flexibilities um, that were created during the COVID public health emergency. Um, so it ex extends them either permanent, permanently or for at least a short period of time following the end of the public health emergency. What is particularly important for us is um, the inclusion of an extension of audio, visual, and audio only visits 
for federally qualified health centers for a, at least a short period of time following the public health emergency. Um, so there's actually a lot of really great content in that bill. AB 285 would um, reestablish the state school nurse consultant position within the Department of Education. AB 586 would, would create the school health demonstration project. And then AB um, 1117 would have restarted the Healthy Start program from the early 200s. Um, and actually that Healthy Start program seeded a lot of our current school-based health centers. So to mention um, what somebody had asked a question about, those four bills, among many other bills, but at least those first four bills have all been like the content of those bills have been adopted into budget trailer bills. So Kate, to answer your question, AB 1117 had a lot of really great content around a health uh, re um, revising and renewing the Healthy Start program. And a lot of that content regarding trauma-informed care and practices, as an example, was adopted in the community schools grant program. Um, so it's not all of it has been adopted, but our partners that were sponsoring that bill um, feel really good with the components that were included in the community schools grant program. So a lot of what was in what has been in all of those bills has been adopted through the budget process. So um, it's actually, you know, as far as I'm concerned, has been a fairly unique year for that. Um, and then the last bill I will just really quickly mention is um, AB 1038 by Assemblymember Gibson, which would establish the California Health Equity Program, which would be a competitive grant program administered by the Office of Health Equity in the Department of Public Health. Um, and funding would be available for community-based nonprofit organizations, community clinics, local health departments, and tribal organizations to take actions related to health equity. So that is a bill that is still going through the process and we are following closely. And there's a link on your slide um, if you to our website where we have a list of all the bills that CSHA has supported this excuse me, this session. Okay. I'm gonna just check to see if there's any questions. Ooh, lots of comments. Um, I'm going to finish with a federal policy update and then I will go back to the questions if we have time and if I don't get to your question, I will reach out to you or please feel free to reach out to me and I will try to answer them. Um, you all have great questions. I'm excited. Um, all right. Regarding federal policy. Whew, this is a lot. There's a lot more than I, I thought it was. <laughs> um, it's been a busy year. Um, in December, so the first one is the second COVID relief package. So in December of 2020, it feels like ages ago, Congress passed and the president signed the second COVID relief package. Um, and if you need a refresher, I always need refreshers. The federal government has passed three COVID relief packages thus far. So this was the second one. Then this COVID package included two small, but in, in our opinion, pretty significant wins for school-based health centers. The first one, um, it included $5 million in funding for school-based health centers through um, uh, the Federal 330 Grant Program, which is, a, which is a grant program, funding program, particularly for federally qualified health centers. So this is $5 million that can go to support school-based health centers that are run by FQHCs. Um, the funding has been announced. The funding has been uh, distributed. Uh, I don't think we have seen who has received funding yet through that $5 million. It was tiny. I think there were many, 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 many applications that went unfunded. Um, but we'll get, we'll get to a little bit more exciting news in a bit. Um, and then also included in the relief package was the reauthorization of a federal school-based health center program. So this program sort of creates a standalone bucket for school-based health centers 
I always, I always explain it. It creates a bucket for school-based health centers within which the federal government can put money, can put appropriations that can go out to school-based health centers. There's no funding allocated for this program yet, but that leads me to what's happening actually right now. Um, the Congress is going through their budget negotiations process. They have a budget year that starts in October. So it's a little bit different than the state. Um, but so they are in the process of negotiating their, our federal budget as we, well, not as we speak, but you know, right around now. Um, the House passed a budget package earlier this summer that includes 50 million total for, to, for new and to expand services at existing school-based health centers. So it's for both new and existing school-based health centers. And it's divided in an interesting way. It's divided in half. 25 million will be available for federally qualified health center, federally qualified sponsored school-based health centers, FQHC sponsored school-based health centers. And the other half would be available through the, the newly reauthorized school-based health center program. And that um, goes to school-based health centers that are not run by federally qualified health centers. And there's lots of reasons why that is, why there's a division. I'm not going to go into it because it's complicated. Um, but I think 50 million total is, is a good increase from 5 million, certainly. Um, the Senate is expected to take up appropriations discussions this September. Um, and we anticipate that they are going to propose 200 million total divided in the same way as the house. So that's very exciting developments. I think at the most, it's exciting to see both chambers of Congress um, see school-based health centers as particularly valuable. And with the caveat that there are a lot of federal dynamics right now that are completely out of our control and not remotely related to school-based health centers, um, that might mean that the Senate does not pass a budget this September and would only pass a continuing resolution. So many of us have probably heard CR, uh, CR talk a lot over the years, certainly. Um, and a continuing resolution basically extends current funding, current spending. And so because school-based health centers are not currently funding, if a continuing resolution passed, we wouldn't see money for school-based health centers this year. So we are waiting to see how those negotiations go in September. Um, I think there's been some incredible groundwork laid at a national level that um, I think will be you know, even if we're not included, school-based health centers aren't included this year, we will see some momentum that we can build on next year. So that is, leads me to, that is, that is all the content. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. Your head's probably spinning. Um, I'm going to pause and go back up and see um, if we can answer some of the questions that I got overwhelmed by. Um, I see a question about an office established years ago and did that not happen? That's a great question. It's a little bit confusing to explain. We had one-time funding for an office for school-based health centers in the Department of Education. And so the Department of Public Health has established a office or a group of staff that are working in an office. <laughs> to support school-based health centers. We've worked with them over the years. Um, I think we are continuing to advocate for a more robust investment on a specific home for school-based health centers um, in the Department of Public Health. The Office of School Health in the Department of Education is not specific to school-based health centers. I think school-based health centers will rise, will, will be an area of interest for that office, but they are not a committed office to the school-based health center model which continues to be one of our hopes for California. I hope that's a satisfying answer. It's a little confusing. I'm happy to, there's lots of, lots of push for offices. Um, but yeah, great question. Uh, 
I see the question about um, understanding about school health centers screen and assess for youth at risk or assessed as having a substance use or opioid disorder. How then do centers interface with local community-based SUD specialty treatment programs? Are there any model programs or best practices that I can connect with? I think yes, and I'm, I think us at CSHA would be happy to um, talk about sort of some of those best practices that we see it's outside the scope of my expertise. So I don't know if I can answer to that question here, but um, I know it's certainly a, a focus of our program staff um, and, and the work that we're doing with school-based health centers. So we can certainly follow up with you separately, talk about that. See lots of really great ideas coming in for what the funding could go to, community outreach, There's a question at the end. Um, do you have any information on the school nurse advocate position at the state level that was a part of the governor's budget? Um, I, I don't know what kind of information. So um, the school nurse consultant, the bill, the Holden bill um, was adopted as part of the trailer bill language. There is funding in the budget for the Department of Education to hire the school nurse consultant position. Um, that school nurse consultant position will be within the Office of School Health at the Department of Education. That was included in the trailer bill language. Um, if you wanna reach out to me uh, separately, I'm happy to, I didn't scan the trailer bill language particularly about that position, position but I'd be happy to go back through and, and see if there's more specifics that I can offer those questions, that question. Um, I see another question about, um, would love our, see, um, I don't know if that's CSBA or CSHA, if you want our support and guidance for how best to position your centers to align with the new funding opportunities, absolutely. I'm happy to work with you offline to sort of think about um, the school-based health centers and wellness centers um, in and healthy start collaborative sites and how to position those in, in some of these investments and, and link them together. Some responses to Liz's questions about screening, school, screening at school-based health centers. Um, so we are almost at 11. I really appreciate everyone's time today um, participating and I, I hope this was informative and not too overwhelming. Um, I live and breathe this stuff so um, I, can, I can get very excited. Um, so I hope you are um, as hopeful for this next year as I am. And um, I guess I just wanna end by acknowledging all of your hard work in, uh, in the field and with children and youth. And I think those of you doing school-based health, I think this recognition at a state and federal level of the role of school-based health is really a testament to the positive work you are doing with students and families and communities. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing a little bit of a sea change in the recognition of, of all your work. So I appreciate that. Thank you for attending today. Um, and we look forward to working with you in the future.